um, here today to talk about the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Drupal. We'll get into that in a moment, what exactly that means. Closing out uh, Florida camp here, the second to last session. So good job, y'all, for surviving and making it. We probably had coffee. We did. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, we're here in, in Orlando, which is kind of, uh, I apologize, but like I think of Disney, uh, that's, that's a shot of me in the high chair. Um, yeah, probably 30 years ago, I guess. Uh, my mom, my brother, and Pluto. Uh, we used to come down to Disney quite a bit. Um, so anyways, it's kind of lodged in, in my head. Uh, Orlando, come on in. Uh, that's okay. Stay for a short as long as you'd like. Um, so I'm Chris Russo. I've been doing Drupal for about 11 years. Um, I used to go by Ill Master C as my uh, moniker, but I decided to pretend I grew up. I thought that would be good for business. So uh, let's go by my name. It's a little boring, uh, but it's the truth. And so for the most part, it can be said that... <laughs> Uh, some of y'all might be familiar with that. Um, if you're not, it'll be in the resources I'll share after. Um, definitely hands down the best cocaine trafficking slash Drupal <laughs> parody out there. <laughs> it's a parody off of uh, Rick Ross, who is a Floridian, who does the song every day, uh, I'm Hustling. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. But, uh, it's funny too, when I was, looking, I was watching the video on YouTube, and um, I've kind of noticed these like slight, you know, differences between Rick Ross and video, <laughs> and the uh, <laughs> New, New Valley Media is who did this. And actually, the guy, uh, Tom Slyker, some of y'all might know him. I don't even know him. I got to talk to him after yeah. this because he's the one. Uh, he's at the conference and he's the one who's doing the rapping. Um, anyway, funny enough, on the, when I was watching on YouTube, they have. Um, you know, like the selected side panel you, you might also like. Um, and they had uh, Weird Al's White and Nerdy on the side there. <laughs> kind of tie that thematically together. That, and they played that at the Dree, right before the Dree's Note at last DrupalCon. That song is such a masterpiece. Uh, you should also check that out if you're not familiar, but I bet almost everyone is. Um, yeah, when I'm not Drupaling, I'm typically found on a bicycle. That's me. Uh, at the train station from in my hometown, Durham, North Carolina, um, getting ready to come. This was actually to go to Drupal Camp NJ, and then uh, this one, I'm also same spot, different day, getting ready to hop on with my folding bike, um, and this is me getting off in Orlando, getting ready to roll on over here. So that was a fun 15-mile journey. Um, just quickly, so much into the bikes, I started a, um, a bicycle service to collect and produce compost at folks' households in Durham, where I'm, where's my hometown. This is a, a friend of mine helped me put together a futon um, into a, and make it into a bike trailer. Oh so this model didn't last forever. <laughs> some, limits, some limitations here. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. And so we named it Tilthy Rich Compost, which allowed me to kind of combine my passion for cycling, environmentalism, and puns. Um, all, all together. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Tilthy Rick. So, you know, whatever. That's me. Um, started that five years ago and then sold it last year because it's difficult to run a, a Drupal agency as well as an uh, environmental uh, company, too. So, um, But if you are looking to make the world a better place in any other way, I'm happy to hear about that after. I'll spare you the details of running through a bunch of slides, which I did in the last talk, which is of all sorts of things I care about that are not related to Jekyll. So we're going to skip all that this time. Um, so that's enough about me. And uh, let's, let's hear about y'all a little bit. Actually, really quickly, do you think Burnt Reynolds ever said, but enough about me? <laughs> did, that, did that ever actually come out of his mouth? When I was looking this up, he, has a, uh, he was a pro football player, too, in addition to like an actor and all that. So I just can't, I just see him like looking scant, like there's a mirror next to him, like you are so handsome. <laughs> He never said enough about me, but I'll move on enough about me. Just curious, uh, 
with the folks in the room um, with this nice, you know, Simpson colored hand. How many folks are developers? So pretty much everyone, yeah, and some of y'all may be moving into other roles. We have to do more than just the fun stuff. Um, how about familiarity with Jekyll and or usage of it? Familiarity, so half C's, um, cool. Um, how about more broadly folks using exclusively Drupal or tools in addition to Drupal to do your web application? So just Drupal, just Drupal, and that's where I was. Everyone else using other tools, okay. All right, so most folks are using other tools, but there certainly are, myself included, although not a developer anymore, um, folks who pretty much just use Drupal. All right, so a quick overview. Um, I'll just talk very quickly about our team, sort of introduce Jekyll. I'll do a, you know, it's pretty quick and simple, so I'll do, I'll assume no knowledge, because there are some folks with no knowledge. I'll, I'll talk quickly why we chose it at the time that we did, and then, you know, of course, do this comparison of strengths and weaknesses, and Jekyll sort of representing all static site generators. Um, and then I'll share a few tools that we built, which I think are, are cool and sort of uniquely tied to a, a static site generator workflow um, that, of course, can also be leveraged in other, uh, in other ways with Drupal, and then share some insights that we've gained. And hopefully, that you'll find uh, that those will be helpful. Um, a quick talk about goals. I'll, I think I yeah, put Lionel Messi static so you don't get too uh, drawn in by him. Uh, just to, to learn something, I know most folks are, are developers or have at least that knack if they're not doing it day to day, so I'll, to, I'll try to share and focus the time there. So about Jekyll and static site generators in general, and again, how those, so those differ. They'll share some sort of platform agnostic tools that I think are, are helpful. Um, yeah, and in addition to the overview, I think that'll all kind of come together. Um, so, you know, if you go to our, our site, and probably many others have something similar to this, you know, we very clearly say we, we make Drupal web systems uh, that propel organizations. So, you know, if we are that, if that's what we're saying we are, you know, why check? Um, so cl clearly that's why you're here. Um, so the Jekyll Hyde, um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which is like a Robert Louis Stevenson novel from the mid 1800s, is essentially about like the duality of man, how we have good and evil. Um, this, you know, in this, you see. He drinks a potion, the doctor, who's this, you know, man about the town, you know, high society, kind of very well respected in his community. Then he drinks his potion that unleashes his Jekyll side, um, er, uh, which is his sort of raw, uh, you know, um, depraved other side of him. Um, by no means am I calling Dries Hyde or any sort of evil, um, I just thought it was a fun picture to put together. Uh, yeah, he doesn't drink potion that makes his hair stand up beautifully or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. Um, I did put in the, in the description that we have some real strong literary tie-ins. You will be disappointed if you're looking for those. Um, you'll see in a moment that the sort of Jekyll reference is a little uh, suspect, at the very least. Not just from me, but why they, the, the tool is named Jekyll. Um, so yeah, clearly it's sort of like and I've had this question even after giving this presentation the first time. So, like, if you build in Drupal and your clients say you don't build in Drupal, is there, can you defend that? Um, and on one hand, it's, it's odd, but on the other hand, using many different tools, the right tool for the job, it's not that, it's not that odd. Um, so we're a team, you know, headquartered in, in Durham, North Carolina. We also have distributed team mem members throughout the U.S., probably like most everyone here. Um, you know, this is just pulled from our website. This is what we look like when we're facing a camera. Of course, like other folks, we have you know, other uh, contractors that we can scale up with. This is our core team. We're Drupal experts, probably like most everyone in here would claim to be as well. Um, got Acquia certification for uh, our, our dev team and we'll probably be getting up to uh, 10 exams in the next couple months. We've got nine, five now, excuse me. Um, we run the, our local meetup, monthly meetup, our Drupal meetup in the Triangle area, which is, you know, two million people in the Triangle. That's Durham, North, uh, Durham, Chapel Hill, and Raleigh. Uh, speak at conferences. Here we are at one, and, you know, we contribute uh, to Drupal, like many of y'all. Um, and, and, of course, you know, share on the blog and all that good stuff. 
Uh, but we're so much more, and there will be really cheesy corporate puns throughout the rest of this that no Jekyll references per se, but those will be replete throughout. So. Um, but we're so much more. We have val- you know, we, this is something we spent a lot of time earlier on. Early on was establishing values as a company, um, and just to highlight a couple quickly, the empathize value is sort of you know put, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. In this case, a client, and a respectful value, which. Um, you know, Aretha helps us know. Is also we also interpret as having honesty and integrity, and ultimately where that leads you is to selecting the right tool for the job for the client. Right? Um, there's no, you know, uh, we don't we don't put ourselves in the assumption that we'll be building in Drupal. Um, we vet that out first, and clearly there's many great use cases for Drupal. So often we are building in Drupal, but not every use case is Drupal. It's like uh, you know, in honor of Black History Month, I think Dr. King said the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward right-sized solutions, <laughs> or maybe justice, or something like that. But you, you, know, you get the idea. So we're trying. You know, we do our strategy and our design, and that's kind of when we're thinking about the right tooling and all that. And we don't want to be in this space where we know it's going to be a Drupal 8 build every time. Again, many often times it is, uh, but we do want to be agnostic at that time to be able to select the right tool for the job. And again, just to wrap up on that, um, you know, we are talking, our tagline, our, our, you know, positioning is talking about web systems. So that, that is uh, connoting that we go beyond just Drupal. And I think you'll, you know, most would agree that m- most modern web technology is that way. And we are sort of client centric. And that's the propel the organization's point. So just to quickly put in context, uh, when we started, why, you know, our history a little bit just to see where we've selected the, the um, Jekyll platform. Um, going back about four years now, uh, I began collaborating with some friends on projects. You know, I, was, I was doing freelance development and um, had enough work that I could bring on some others. So uh, you know, I began that collaboration, I guess, going on close to five years. And then we came to this point where we're like, all right, let's, you know, we have enough work here. If I step out of development role, um, we could really build something cool and, and uh, something that we'd really, you know, enjoy coming to work each day for. So in uh, 2015, b- very beginning of 2015, that's what we did. Uh, hired our director of technology and then uh, two contractors and then the next week another hire, uh, full-time hire. And our director of technology, I was looking back and I got an email from him on the 26th that was like, hey, this Jekyll thing, I think we should really try it for our site. I've built some sites and it's really simple, it works well for our needs. So just a couple days later, we were having a lunch and learn. It was our first lunch and learn, and we, uh, he shared, uh, Costa, his name's Costa, shared uh, Jekyll. And kind of we went through it and uh, said, all right, this does make sense for us. Uh, mind you, this was a time where we had started getting work, uh, but didn't even have any name, um, obviously web presence. So we're sort of in this like, oh, it's great that we have work. It's sort of odd to start this way, but we also need to get up there and be credible pretty quickly. So, um, And then some couple weeks later, in late February, I posted uh, the work I did on uh, our Jekyll sites, open source, it's been open source since, um, so all of our like workflow is, is visible. So what did we perceive as our needs in 2015? And I say perceive because obviously hindsight is 2020 and you know, you think you need something at a time and we know when we're working with clients they don't always need what they think they need. Um, as I just mentioned, you know, we are, uh, we're looking to get something up yesterday. You're probably familiar with this paradigm with some of your clients. As soon as possible, let's get this thing out. It's not the best place to always be because you can't be as thoughtful or, and as thorough about the future. Uh, but it, we definitely had that urgency, so we're looking to get something up quickly. Um, we wanted to limit costs. We're a new, you know, new company, and you know, less you can pay for hosting and maintenance and that sort of thing, uh, the better that admittedly doesn't think about the full value spectrum, but that was was a desire of ours up front. Um, we wanted to ease maintenance. <coughs> um, this was, don't mind you, at the time, very shortly after the infamous Drupal or Drupa get in, depending on how you like to pronounce that, um, which was, uh, it's funny because I was looking this up and uh, Drupal security team adopted uh, sort of this NIST scoring format, 25 points, 25 being the highest threat if it checks all these boxes. 
And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Drupageddon, Drupageddon was twenty. It definitely was twenty five out of twenty five, and I don't think there's been any other since then. And on, ironically, it was like only a couple months after they implemented this scoring system. So, um, you know, at, this is a time where like, oh, maintenance can there can there's a drag sometimes. You know, you, you may re recall there was the if you didn't apply the patch within seven hours, you know, it's safe to assume your family's dead or something. <laughs> like that. It, it was sort of very strongly, you know, cautious, which is what a security advisory team should be. Um, but it was a little scary. And, uh, uh, and the, maybe the last or second to last need here was blog capabilities. We knew we wanted to write blog articles, but, um, you know, our, our thinking probably was a little limited at the time as far as the content that we'd want to create. And lastly, we just wanted something that we were familiar with. Um, so it, there wasn't a big learning curve to building. Uh, so that's, that's what we did. So enter stage Jekyll. Remember the timeline here. Um, so what is Jekyll? Jekyll is a blog-aware static site generator in Ruby. Sort of oddly worded in my opinion, but this is what shows up on their GitHub page. Uh, they've been, uh, Jekyll was created about 10 years ago and has actually cr coincided with the creating of GitHub, which we'll get to in a second. Um, Tom Preston Werner is one of the uh, three or four co-founders of GitHub. Started Jekyll in the Ruby community in the Bay Area. Um, and then started GitHub right, right around the same time. Uh, so just to break that down, written in Ruby, not PHP, different programming language. Blog aware just basically means there's pretty simple structures to create blog content, dates and titles, and, and the way that it appears on the website. Um, and it's a static site generator. So <coughs> um, this is maybe the, the biggest thing to focus on, a, a big departure from Drupal and other you know, server-side technologies. Jekyll, essentially, when you're trying to deploy something new, you build out the full site each time. So you're creating, your build process is creating flat HTML, CSS, JS files. So those flat files are not dynamic, but they, on the flip side, can be served from anywhere. Um, so you don't get the interaction you can with a server-side scripting language like PHP, but on the flip side, you build out your files, boom, they're done, you push them up so that those can be really... Uh, really performant. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, this is from, um, st uh, I'll pull this up in a second, but staticgen.com, which is a, a, a uh, well, I'll show you in a second, but it's just a quote that says, um, gives a little context to what, you know, putting what a static site generator is in another. Um, Say to be said another way. So this is that was a slide, and this is actually staticsitegen.com. So you can see that Jekyll is the top as far as um, most popularly starred on GitHub, and then there are these other languages, of course, or other platforms, Go, written in Go and JavaScript, and many others. Um, this is a pretty good resource. We'll come back to it in a in a second, and it's been up for a while. Um, yeah, staticgen.com. Um, and as I just showed you, to give you a little context, uh, Jekyll's 30, it's got roughly 33,000 stars. That's 54th on GitHub. Um, I don't know if you, anyone's familiar with this uh, NVBM library. Um, rhymes with the luck, but that's not what it is. Um, it, it, you, you enter that particular curse word and it like redoes the previous command but fixes it. It's kind of interesting. I've never used it, but I only found out about it like, oh, this is a really popular thing, this crassly name, so interesting. Um, for context, this is a Jekyll sites you may have heard of, healthcare.gov. You can argue whether or not you want to promote that. Um, and the bootstrap site is a Jekyll site. Uh, so you might be asking yourself, I, I alluded to this a minute, a minute ago, like why Jekyll? Why, you know, what's the why Jekyll, like what, why the name Jekyll, how does that apply to the static site generator? You very well may not be asking yourself that as well. I didn't ask myself that for three years while we were using it. Um, does anyone know? I'm gonna take a safe guess as no. I'm not sure anyone knows this, like in the world. Uh, there's nothing in their docs that says anything about it. I checked all of them. Uh, besides like one instance in their config example of Hyde, you know, Mr. Hyde. Is I followed, the, um, I checked out the blog of the guy Tom Werner, uh, Preston Werner I was talking about, nothing there, checked 
back in Twitter, nothing there. I posted, a ta I posted an issue to a forum, asked like, hey, what's up with this? Where did this come from? Nothing. I went to IRC, um, and I appreciate it. You probably can't read all of this, but this guy, Alejo, said, he gave me this answer, uh, and then he ends it with, but I really just made that up out of sheer boredom, shruggy. Um, so I, I, I learned, in this pursuit, I learned that um, people are bored in IRC and are willing to offer up information. Surprise, surprise. Uh, so for the time being, I really don't know why they called it Jekyll. Um, not as important to looking under the hood. Um, so let's take a, a quick look. Bicycle hoods, by the way. Um, so whether or not you can see this, there's some very basic um, structure to Jekyll. We'll take them one by one, and I'll bring it over to PHP Storm so you can see it. Um, this config YAML file, uh, the layouts directory, posts directory, underscore sites directory. So let's take those one at a time. All right, so the config YAML file you can think of as similar to settings.php in Drupal. Um, let me pull up uh, a bunch of presentation notes. So this is, um, this is PHP Storm and this is our um, website. I'll just Do you use the paid version or the community version? I'll get there in a second. Yeah. Um, are you talking about PHP Storm? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we pay for it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we pay for it. Um, sorry, I thought you were talking about Jekyll hosting. So whatever, it's got simple things you would, you would might override in settings.php. You remember there's no database, so um, whatever. We've got our tagline, we've got various things we'll touch on later about the comment server, but some pretty sort of simple uh, things there. There's the layouts directory. So that... Uh, if I take this out of presentation, go back over here, layouts. So um, I'll just pull up the post.html. You can see that it's similar to uh, Liquid is the templating engine in Jekyll, similar to um, Twig for Drupal 8, right? Some pretty ba basic uh, variable drop-ins, you can loop over stuff, you can do some basic if else but for the most part, it's pretty simple drop-ins uh, into template files. Very similar to a Drupal theme. Post directory, we'll go back to, uh, sorry, post. The post is where you put blog posts into, so it's just a directory and you drop them in in a certain pretty simple format, and that replace, replaces on the D8 side or Drupal side, you know, the database that, that stores content in the database. Um, so let's go over to posts and just take a quick look at one there. Yeah, and feel free to jump in with any questions as we're covering stuff because that may be the best time to answer those things. I'll take a quick example in you know, a most recent blog post I've written. Um, this is uh, this next slide, but this is what's called front matter in Jekyll. So this is kind of at the top of each file where you give it some additional information about what that file is, relevant, you know, in this case it's a blog post, so we, this is where we put tags and who's the author and what's the date, what's the title, that sort of thing. But you have a lot of uh, control over how to add variables to the, the front matter. And then this is just a markdown file. So, you know, um, headings, and if you're familiar with markdown and, and that sort of format, and just, just basically text. Uh, and links, you know, and images that way, you know, very simple ways of putting in quotes for people. Angie Byron, who's right down the hall right now. <coughs> um, so pretty simple. And as I just talked about, uh, front matter. And then, and then the site, underscore site directory is very much like uh, Drupal's index PHP. And what I mean by that is... Um, you know, in Drupal, everything funnel, every page funnels through index.php and then routes uh, wherever else. In the case of Jekyll, again, with the static site generation, uh, hopefully, I don't know if I go to presentation mode, if you can see this side. No, you can't. Um, the site directory is where everything gets built into. So that's, uh, you know, you saw in the case of the last blog post we wrote in 2017, that blog post is going to be you know, sawdustlabs.com slash 2017 slash month slash title of blog post. So, so all of that gets, and you can see.
see that here, all that gets just built into uh, statically and then ending up with an HTML file. So, um, so that's how that's served pretty easily once you've got the, um, once you do the full build. And one last thing to cover in Jekyll, uh, you know, the Ruby Gems ecosystem, this is where you can, much like the Drupal modules ecosystem, this is where you can pull in uh, various little snippets of functionality that help power your, your Jekyll site further. Uh, some, you know, I'll talk about this in a second, but we serve our site over GitHub pages. There's a gem for that. Another example would be HTML proofer, which uh, goes, goes through and loops through and sees if your links are still active for all your blog posts, that kind of thing. HTML proofer, mm -hmm. and I'll touch on that again in a moment. Um, so, okay, so meet Jekyll Cat. Uh, she powers GitHub pages. As I mentioned, Jekyll and, and GitHub were uh, created essentially at the same time. Jekyll Cat, or sorry, Jekyll Cat, otherwise known as OctoCat, um, has five legs for some reason, <laughs> not eight. And there's, if you're interested, more information about that, but it has been confirmed. Um, yeah, so um, what, I'll talk quickly about what we liked about Jekyll and then I'm gonna do a little bit of a, a code, live coding thing to show you some of the tools and we'll kind of wrap up after that. So what worked for us in 2015, remember that's when we made this decision. So the database free thing is pretty big um, or is an advantage that, you know, depending on your use case can be pretty compelling. A lot, you know, when you're only creating flat files, you can make really high performance sites. There's no server side processing, so it's only limited by, you know, your CDN or whatever you may be using. In the case of GitHub, obviously, that's a pretty robust infrastructure to be um, serving your site from. With no database, you're totally mit mitigating some of the mo highest risks, according to like the o OWASP top 10, uh, you know, SQL injection being the number one risk broken authorization and uh, broken access control. You know, there is no access control. These are all just flat files. So there's a substantial risk mitigation and potential performance uh, boost. It's hard for the site not to perform well. Um, and then again, there's lower maintenance costs, right? Like the, the um, Drupageddon example, you know, we're never having to worry about applying a patch within a few hours because there's no database backend. So the, so and you can host on GitHub pages entirely for free. So you can, uh, that, uh, the workflow, which I'll talk about right now, is as simple as merging a pull request into a certain branch and you know that does its build and you can optionally choose if you want to run that through Travis to run some additional tests, which we do. Um, but if you didn't, boom, you merge it, code's live and it deploys within a minute. Um, so it's a really nice workflow. There's no SSHing into servers. There's no additional stuff there. That worked for us because we had general familiarity. We weren't Ruby experts. We're certainly still not Ruby experts, but it's uh, abstracted enough away from Ruby that you only have to do basic variable manipulation. And again, just writing in markdown files and you know having command line familiarity, that sort of thing was, was pretty straightforward to us. Using GitHub, that, that whole workflow very much part of what we, we always did. Um, and our whole team was technical. So the way we still have it is it's like you're still running command line uh, commands, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, and that worked for us then, but there are some limitations for non-technical folks trying to, uh, you know, being, being proficient in deploying new things in Jekyll. <clears throat> so in the Jekyll sphere, we uh, adopted linters, and I'll touch on some of those. Uh, if you're not familiar, a linter, is a tool that analyzes static source code. So as opposed to generating errors as, uh, you know, as you receive a request and you see that some form errors, linters just look at, hey, is your JavaScript well-formed? Is your markdown well-formed? And if not, let me let you know about that because it may, it may be that it's gonna be more costly to maintain or an error may be produced from it. Um, so as I just mentioned, we adopted a markdown linter um, which just helps us have a consistent style and output to our blog posts, which is primarily where we're writing Markdown, but we also create other pages in Markdown. ESLint, if you're familiar with that, is a good linter for JavaScript. Um, ProseLint is one we'll, we'll take a look at in a second. It's pretty cool. Um, it helps, you know, if you're writing blog posts, it helps sort of critique primarily. It's a little sassy, you'll see this. Um, what you've written, and if that's good writing. Um, 
and you can really fine tune it. We haven't done a ton of fine tuning, but it's pretty interesting. It's helpful for us to sort of be putting out credible content and writing proper grammar and all that. And then SCSS lint, and there's tons of other linters uh, that the team would know better than I would. But um, in addition to uh, linters, we use uh, browser sync, and so this is kind of getting at um, browser sync helps dynamically reload the system uh, in the browser when you're making changes on the Jekyll side. That's a big distinction between, you know, Drupal, you're familiar, you just make a change and you make the request and it's up and you see it. Jekyll, you sort of have to rebuild, right, to see that new change. So browser sync helps, helps with that. I mentioned HTML proofer already. Um, uh, you know, ensuring that your links are still working. Obviously, lots of times, two years later, you might still have a popular blog post and you reference something, but that reference has changed its URL or whatever it can be. When people click that, you kind of lose credibility. You don't, you know, you're not looking as um, <clears throat> current, and this helps just highlight those things that we as humans obviously would never go back and look at. Um, <clears throat> We adopted some minification tools, much like uh, Drupal does this out of the box, or if you download, you know, modules like Ag, Advanced Aggregation, uh, the ability to shrink CSS and JS files and images and all that to continue to push that performance higher and higher are some tools we adopted. And then there's tooling around responsive images and that sort of thing as well. As I mentioned, SCSS lint. Uh, and we built lots. All right, so this is where I'll kind of dive. Uh, we'll go through what we built pretty quickly, try to do a live code, and, th and then kind of wrap that up on some sort of lessons learned. Um, so we have a living style guide. Um, we use this tool called Hologram, which I believe is uh, written by Trulia, if I, or, you know, much like many companies open source what they worked on. Uh, so it's a, nice, uh, it's a nice tool. It was something that I, when we were doing our redesign uh, a year ago, was able to be on the kind of client side of that and see what that's like. Um, let me go to, I'll just show you the live version of that. We've gotten some, you know, this is our live website, sabaslabs.com slash style guide. Um, bunch of notes up here for developers and, and folks who would be building on top of this about how it works. But it's pretty, it's pretty cool. You just write comments and that those comments are generated into markup. Um, so it's pretty easy to maintain and makes it easy to port right into your template. Uh, so we've got, you know, I mean, you put high primary colors, secondary colors. For us, obviously, we're, write, we're writing about code. So what does our code highlighting look like? What do various components of the page look like? Here's an alert. Article headings, I think we've got case studies, you know, arrow buttons. Uh, yeah, case study block. And what does it look like on a hover? That sort of thing. So hologram is a pretty cool um, tool. Um, and we built uh, a comment backend. So if you don't have a database, uh, it's hard to store comments. I'm sure there's a flat file way to do this. Uh, but what we ended up building was uh, a SQLite and Lumen comment in, uh, backend. And that lives on a Docker container and on a small Linode instance. So we, in a way, haven't totally removed ourselves from the database. Um, and Lumen is a subset of Laravel. PHP uh, micro framework. Um, yeah, so you know we wanted comments. We chose not to use uh, discuss, which a lot of people use, but they kind of had some privacy concerns at the time that we were making this selection, and so we opted against that. You know, there's trade-offs to that decision, but ultimately we ended up building uh, what what is a pretty simple but it works uh, back comment back end. And then, of course, we also needed to build the front end to that. Jekyll doesn't have a, you know, comments aren't a thing in Jekyll. Um, so we built a React uh, comment front end. And I'll just, I have, a, I have that pulled up. Here's, uh, here's, I think, one of our more commented blog posts, uh, um, ironically, or not ironically, but appropriately, about optimizing Jekyll performance. And Gulp, we use Gulp for our task running. Um, but if I go all the way down, it's a pretty lengthy post. Good on you, Anne. Um, you know, we brag about our performance that we get out of this 100 out of 100 for, um, yeah, there you go. Give yourself a high five. Um, you know, these are all being served from a React.js front end that's talking to our comment back end, which we've called Squabble. So 
and, you know, we've just recently rolled out these avatars that go alongside, um, and we're going to be doing a bunch more right now. Well, pretty soon we'll be implementing a, uh, um, a rich text editor, WYSIWYG type thing, as it stands. It's just uh, plain, um, plain text, and then, you know, name and email, that type of stuff. Uh, we implemented a custom spell checker, and you'll see that some of the themes, some of the themes here is just uh, something we should all think about when we're building and writing for ourselves. It's just uh, credibility. There's a lot of research. I, um, I know there's a group at Stanford that does like, credibility research on the web, and you can find them linked from lots of other blog articles. But spell, you know, misspellings is one of the highest, <coughs> uh, essentially, marks against your credibility, probably unsurprisingly, right? And it's sort of surprising, at least from my perspective, how easy it is to misspell things um, and miss that after review and that sort of thing. So um, we've got a, we built a custom spell checker and using the uh, A spell library, and we'll take a look at that in a second. Um, and we built a, a powerful pre-commit hook. So are y'all familiar with pre-commit hooks? Essentially, uh, it's a uh, you know, when you're writing git commit, and we'll do this in a second, it'll pop up. Um, you can set whatever conditions you want in there for it to inform you, are you sure you want to commit this? That kind of, that's the main use case for it. So we'll look at that in one second. Um, and that kind of, we've tied together using proslint and the spell checking and a few other things that I'll touch on quickly during that pre-commit hook. So we have kind of two thresholds, the pre-commit hook and then the Travis tests that run each time we uh, do a pull request. All right, so let's get to the live coding. What could go wrong? Good luck. <laughs> Never does. I mean, it's, this is like JV live coding. Uh, well, yeah, what could go wrong? I don't know if you all have seen this. Um, the Hawaii accidental missile yeah. alert. <laughs> They're just like some bad... Uh, can't, oh, no! Windows is updating. And then there was this other one I yeah, really liked yeah, yeah, yeah. to send test the one ad pops in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, live coding. So let me see. I created this example. No, it's on this page. This example, um, where is it? Down here. Blog post. <clears throat> Very simple. Yeah, I stole the Triple Camp logo, put it at the top, pretended, you know, this isn't on our live site. This is my local version. Um, and I just put some text in here. Uh, you'll see that some of it has errors, and, we'll, and hopefully the, it'll tell us about those errors. Um, yeah, so I created that. I'll show you that on this end of things. <coughs> uh, where are we? Posts. So, you know, as you've already seen in other blog posts, pretty simple. Again, markdown. Um, and I've got some notes to myself about uh, what should show up here. You can see, you know, this, this recognizes a misspelling. So it's another way to, of course, check on misspellings. But so let's go to the command line over here. Where is it? Where did it go on me? Maybe I could just pull it up over here. Yeah, but another desktop somewhere. Um, all right, so we are in my web root, and hopefully, you know, I'll make it bigger. I'm going to try to make it bigger. Oh, how did I make it at the top again? That was nice. Let me do clear. Okay. Um, so I'll just show you that. We're, so I've added these, you know, the image file. We're looking in my um, Salas Labs root. I've added the image file. I've made a quick change to um, a gulp file to run another test more quickly than we otherwise would for this, and just added that blog post file, right? So if I, there are going to be some errors in this, so I ought to see that if I add the, um, let me do it clear again so you can see it at the top. If I do, if I add the file, 
and I see that it's ready to be added, and I go to clear again. <laughs> we'll just focus, there's gonna be other errors, but we'll focus on the spelling errors first, which popped up um, first. So it tells me that I've misspelled Drupal Camp and the word correctly. Let's go back to, right now I'm lost in the world of other desktops, there we go. Um, so we saw correctly, so I'll, I'll correct that. And then, where was Drupal Camp? You know, we're, we're gonna say like Drupal Camp is a word we wanna use, like that's a real thing. Um, even though you might not recognize it in English dictionary, we want to add that. So let me go out of presentation mode. I've got, we've got this uh, word list text file. So we've got a custom dictionary that we say these are appropriate words. If I add Drupal Camp to that, I'll go back to um, this, and, uh, and we've uh, run, all we need to do is run a what is it? A spell. So we run that script, and now it says, okay, add that custom word to the dictionary. So now we should, and I corrected correctly, so now we should see that um, the spelling errors are gone. Okay, cool. Um, spelling errors are gone, but now we got markdown lint errors. Um, there's trailing spaces, um, which it doesn't like. Uh, and then there's some prose lint errors. So I was, I was telling you about the proslint being sassy before. For example, it doesn't like the word very. It thinks mm -hmm. that's, you know... And like that's a great ex English feature. Exactly, exactly. And it's got this whole reference of like 10 scholars, you know, that um, each of these, uh, you know, dating back to like Mark Twain, like each of these rules wow. is one of their rules. So it doesn't like very... Um, I, I have a couple exclamations in there and it's like, Take it easy. You don't. Like, you're not that excited. You shouldn't be including that sort of stuff. Um, so it, give, it gives you that full, um, you know. And, and there's a. And we have a means to say like, I want to keep the double exclamations. Like it's, you know, it's okay. Um, but it gives you that kind of full feedback. So let's see. Um, it may. It may not be worth trying to go through and fixing all of these. But wanted to give you a sense that um, at commit time that you get this feedback that is, you know, for us, again, we're, we're sensitive to spelling and grammar, and we want to make sure we're coming off professionally. Um, gives you that feedback at commit time. And that's kind of a nice distinction. Since there's no database, every time you push anything new to the site, it is a git commit, so it's got that very kind of atomic element to it versus, you know, it's harder to control that through, like, a Drupal form on a, if you're a blog post on a node page that somebody else might write. Um, so that, those are, you know, some big QA wins we think in this, in this using this kind of tooling. So let me get back to there. We go. <laughs> Missing one there. Um, and on, honest, I've just noticed this yesterday. Um, this is something the uh, the static C gen uh, st static site generator tool is, appears on their like home page. If you look closely, it says takes a different approach and generate all the pages, not generates all the pages, and uh, of the website once theirs actually changes to the site instead of there are changes to the site. So, you know, these are like that site's been up for years. These are things that can slip through the cracks pretty easily, and it's nice to have that extra set of robot eyes to kind of verify that for you. Um, yeah, so things, things the team liked, you know, we didn't have to master learning a new language, but, we, but you do get familiar to new frameworks. So like Ruby and a new framework just opens your mind to new, you know, new ways of thinking. There's lots of research about being bilingual, I wish I were, um, and how that, you know, just thinking in those sort of structures really opens up your mind and is advantageous. So, you know, just having another tool is, is advantageous. There were parallels. I showed, you know, the Jekyll uh, templates, liquid templates, twig templates, um, you know, there's package systems that we use now with Composer, very similar to Bundler and, and Ruby Gems in the NPM world. Um, and we started that 
you know, three years ago. So that was kind of an easier onboarding to Drupal 8. And there were some things like performance. You know, we, in that blog post I showed, there was a lot of uh, talk about performance, and we had to get kind of a deeper understanding on some of that than you would with a Drupal, because uh, Drupal will do a lot of the things for you that we had to sort of learn at a more fundamental level. So there's more learning there. Of course, there's a trade-off on time. And this is just a quote I pulled from um, Anne, who's, who's done the most work on our Jekyll site, um, you know, I was asking for feedback about what it's been like to work with, and you know, her, her quote is, it absolutely helped me become a better developer. So clearly that's a good thing to hear. Um, and we stuck, we stuck with it for, um, uh, our, like I mentioned, our most recent redesign. Um, and there's you know, reasons for that, for inertia, but we're mostly uh, looking to put up a a more current looking design than we had had in time for DrupalCon for last, for last year's DrupalCon. So we did stick with, <clears throat> with Jekyll. So what, you know, what does that look like for us now? Definitely doing a retrospective. Yeah, Y'all should, if you don't already do these for projects anyway, where you look back and you think about what you can improve, what you could have done differently. Um, there were definitely some drawbacks. You know, I mentioned uh, highly technical needs. There are ways to make it a little lower barrier from, from a technical perspective, but um, we wouldn't, you know, we're looking to hire a marketing director and we wouldn't expect them to be on the command line issuing commands to deploy a site. Um, you know, we had to build things that exist in Drupal. Uh, we built the comment infrastructure that wasn't free. Um, you know, we built out case study comment content types and we're looking to do more of that. That's very easy to do in Drupal. It's a little bit more, you're on your own. Jekyll. Um, and then there's all the sort of stuff you don't get for free that you might take it take for granted in Drupal. When, you know, and this is often spoken about in this sort of headless context too, where people are leaving some of the bloat of Drupal behind. You're also leaving a lot of value. So there's no admin UI. That's all code. There's no, there's no search out of the box. There's no, there are no forms. Um, and for many of these, there's other ways to do it, but they, they become workarounds. There's no user accounts, that sort of thing. You get a lot with internationalization with Drupal. You get a lot with accessibility out of the box. Um, and, and one of the biggest drawbacks was we didn't get to uh, you know, work in our bread and butter, Drupal 8. This, there's a, this was, um, it's still the case, and I've heard folks, uh, folks here talking about it, that, you know, there's four times as many, there are four times as many sites on Drupal 7 than there are Drupal 8. So there's still demand for Drupal 7 out there, and of course we're all wanting to work on Drupal 8, and we missed some of that opportunity, some of that time we were working in another platform. So there's drawbacks to that. There's drawbacks to the regeneration of the site each time. Um, it is slow. Yeah. Our build process to rebuild the site takes, if we run through all our tests and all that, takes 10 or 15 minutes. But even on just the uh, I make a quick change. You know, I was talking about browser sync before. Some of that, some of that's a little slower. You don't get that immediate response, and, it, and there's tooling around it to help with that. But a potential thing we could have used was Sculpin, which is a P, uh, PHP static site generator tool. So we could have gotten some more object-oriented PHP experience with Sculpin. Had we done that three years ago? Um, yeah. So we ask ourselves, you know, where do we go from here? And Dr. King. Drupal or Jekyll, what we're, what we're weighing is um, we, want to, we want to be creating more diverse content. We want to um, have an easier administration, as I was talking about with the marketing director. And we want more ac interactivity on the site. And when people are engaged with content, we want, want to kind of know more about that. Um, so there are, there are ways to do that in uh, Jekyll, but it's not as easy and it's not as out of the box as it would be with Drupal. So the answer is, is we're not totally sure at this point. Um, and then just to share a few insights before we go, I think we're kind of in this paradigm that was similar to WordPress, we, similar way we talk about comparing WordPress and Drupal. In other words, we started with pretty simple needs, and as our needs became more complex, the tool, the baseline tool of Jekyll is, is a little bit limited. So we're you know, thinking about what a transition looks like. Again, you know, people aren't thinking about are we going to go to Jekyll instead of Drupal as much in the general Drupal ecosystem, but we are talking and have been for years a lot about headless. So there's a lot of similarities here. We've built, um, you know, our own comment infrastructure and there's trade-offs and, and flexibilities that come with that. So 
the same kind of thinking applies to the sort of headless space. Um, I liked this quote, uh, this open source conference um, called All Things Open in the Triangle, where I, where I live. Uh, be liberal about learning new technologies and approaches. Be conservative about using them. So, you know, you want to you want to train, you want to learn, and a lot of times that's most helpful on your internal tools. And then you want to be really confident and prepared when you're building for clients. So, you know, there was a means that we lost some of that uh, internal building. Um, but again, similar to the sort of headless concept here, you know, you want to be really thoughtful about years out what you're really going to need. Um, and then, and, and again, thinking years out, as we think about that total value, I think this is, you know, something we very much talk with our clients about. Let's think X amount of years out. Um, it's something, you know, we're doing now and maybe wish we were able to do a little more thoroughly at the outset to, to think about um, what tool would, be, would best serve us for years to come. <laughs> and time's up. You know, frankly, time's up for gross men to get away with you know, harassment and other things with impunity, but it's time, it's time, time's up to be building just in Drupal. You know, you're definitely needing to be building other tools. Uh, this is from Dries' uh, or Aquia's. Um, uh, they do the annual survey of, of Drupal, and you know these these are the percentages of people using other tools. So um, there's uh, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of benefit to using other tools, and frankly, it's kind of the norm now. Um, yeah. So like I mentioned, we've got all of our code open source uh, on uh, our on our GitHub profile, so you can check out some of the tools I talked about, the pre-commit hook, all that, all that good stuff, and I'll share the slides on Twitter and, and um, in the uh, Florida camp uh, area, and those are the resources, and that is the end. So, I think we're, I think we're running pretty close to the next timing. Yeah. I, uh, if there are any questions, I can take a quick one, or I'll answer anything out in the hall to, to respect. Maybe a quick one. Have you tried, um, I, I'm, I've, I've got a few Jekyll sites hooked up to Contentful, but have you mm. tried nice. hooking sites up to uh, Content, what's the Drupal version of that? Contenta. Contenta. CMS. Yeah. I began to and got a little lost because again, I'm not as sharp on my development skills anymore. But yeah. yeah. That would be my dream. That's kind of like my dream. I'm looking for somebody to set that up as like, one Drupal Contenta with all these Jekyll sites kind of using it as content APIs. Yeah. Building. Do you yeah. consider doing um, do an API calls to GitHub to push um, push down markdown to Drupal? Hmm. No. Uh, we did that on our site. Our, our site redesigns um, going to go live soon. Um, and you know, there's there's got to just like with anything, but we liked the idea of doing it decoupled with it. So Drupal CMS back in, yeah. and really it didn't have to be public, but you know, uh, we, we actually went with GitLab, which also has a good API, they, they both have good API calls, so you can, um, you have like a connector module, map over field data, and push it, push it with API calls. Nice. And again, there's more options I can walk you through, you don't have, <laughs> yeah. don't have enough time to do, but totally. uh, it is an interesting approach. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. And speaking of time, I'm definitely overlapping here, so I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you, Drupal. Florida Drupal Camp. <laughs>